Hey guys, welcome back to Recording Artist Explained. I'm Bridges, and this is video two, entitled, Versatility is Overrated. Um, I decided to make this video because a lot of artists, they, <clears throat> they get hung up on proving their versatility. They want, they want everybody to know that they can do everything. You know, they want to show that they can rap, they want to show that they can do Latin music, they want to show, you know, they want to have like a, an, an island type song, they want to do trap, they want to just show how versatile they are. Um, no one wants that. No one wants that from any artist. Uh, people want an artist to do a very specific thing and they want them to do that very well. And I'm not saying that that thing can't evolve over time because obviously it should, it should change with, with the times. Um, but, you know, for instance, I worked with Miguel extensively and Miguel, you know, he's very influenced by Prince and he's very influenced by Jimi Hendrix. And then he's very influenced by, you know, like modern R&B, modern hip hop kind of stuff. Miguel's not going out there and doing heavy metal and Miguel's not going out there and doing future bass. He's doing what he does and he's evolving with that. So that's why I'm making this video that versatility is overrated. Uh, artists are defined just as much by what they don't do as what they do do. This brings us to our main concept for video two, the pyramid. I was introduced to this concept by a good friend of mine named Kevin Hastings, who I shared the stage with with Miguel for a period of time. Basically, the pyramid is all about picking the three cornerstones of your music because you know if you pick more than that it starts to sound convoluted it's kind of like cooking you know um have you ever noticed you look at a menu and there aren't that many main ingredients it's kind of because if there are that many main ingredients it starts to it starts to taste like nothing it's like everything and nothing at the same time um and you know you could you could extend the pyramid to maybe four things maybe five things um, but three is kind of the magic number. Let's think about this for some really famous artists. Let's take Adele. Uh, if I were just thinking about what Adele's pyramid could be, one, uh, vintage instruments, you know, like kind of a, a throwback-y 50s, 60s, 70s type feel with the instruments. So, you know, real instruments, lots of um, lots of tubes, lots of saturation, um, you know, not really crazy high end, you know, want to make it sound vintage. So number two would be in the lyrics that she writes. Um, one of my favorite songs by her is When We Were Young. Um, and I, I love the lyrics of the song. I love the song, um, period. But the song talks about, it uses uh, very very personal and very specific situations in her life. Might be true, might not be true. But uh, the storyline is, you know, she, she sees this guy at a party that she used to have, she used to share her life with. And then she sees how time has passed. Um, and basically they just kind of reflect on the time they had and they reflect on how time is passing for everybody. So basically um, her, I would say that number two would be very, very personal lyrics and, uh, very personal lyrics that encompass allegorical things that we we all have in common um, and you know that's really true of most songs but she I mean most great songs that that have a lot of likes but she really seems to hit upon you know like the global big song over and over again I'd say she really has a knack for that um, and then I would say Number three for her would be ballads. I mean, the ballads just really show off her voice. And with the ballads come the arrangement styles. She's, she always has very sparse arrangements that show off the intricacies of her voice. Um, so to recap, one would be vintage, uh, vintage instruments and playing styles and sonics. So just vintage sonics all across the board. Number two would be the personal, uh, seemingly specific and personal lyrics that appeal to everyone globally. Number three would be the ballads that show off her voice. Obviously it's easier to show off vocals during a ballad than it is like some crazy future bass drop or something. So arrangements that show off her voice. 
I'm sure you've noticed by now, if you've paid attention to Adele, that there are a bunch of things she's not going to give you. Like Adele is not going to give you EDM buildups or she's not going to give you a drop. She's not going to give you, you know, uh, she's not going to give you saws that are opening and closing with an LFO. She's not going to give you anything EDM like. She's not going to give you, um, she's not going to give you anything hip hop like. She's not going to, uh, she's not going to rap. You know what I'm saying? Adele is just as defined by what she doesn't do as what she does do. Let's, let's try another. So post Malone, if I were to think about what his pyramid could be, I would say it would be nursery rhymes. Um, I'm sure you've noticed that post melodies are extremely symmetrical. They're extremely repetitive and they're very, uh, I mean, nursery rhyme is just like, you know, very like twinkle twinkle little star like or uh, Yankee Doodle went to town like very nursery rhyme like check it out if you haven't noticed that number two would be trap drums like all across the board he's got trap drums uh, very in right now and he has his uh, his producer Louis Bell who I love his production uh, he has a very signature kind of way that he does it he uses different sounds than everybody um, yeah so trap drums and then number three I'd say uh, he uses a lot of like 80s sounding synths and kind of retro guitar sounds like Post is actually a really good guitarist um, So yeah, his his Hip-hop has kind of a more organic feel than a lot of the other hip-hop that's out there post pyramid would be the nursery rhyme Slash singing slash rapping vocal delivery that he's kind of that he's got going on No one else is doing it like him then the trap drums uh, and then the 80 cents and uh, the guitar elements. In the next video, you'll meet a dear friend of mine named Meg DeLacy, who's an artist who I've been developing for the past two years, and we'll ask her some questions about what her pyramid might be. Let's see if I get it right. Hey guys, I just finished talking about the pyramids of famous artists that, you know, anyone in this time period would know Adele and Post Malone. We just talked about the pyramids, the three cornerstones that make their sound. And now I'd like to talk about the pyramid of a very good friend of mine, um, an artist I've been working with for the last two years. I've had the privilege to develop alongside with her. And uh, her name is Meg DeLacy. Hey, what's up? <laughs> and uh, I'm going to ask her some questions. Well, actually, I'm going to talk about her and I'm going to ask some questions. So, um, as far as Meg's pyramid, which I had the privilege of co-creating with her, I would say that the three cornerstones to Meg's sound, uh, Meg has a tremendous respect for R&B music. And that's R&B music from uh, times of old and, and now. So I, basically, I feel like as long as it's R&B, I can draw from a lot of different places. Like I, I'll utilize you know, like Motown bass, like I'll pick up my P bass and play like some James Jamerson kind of stuff and she'll be down. Or I can, you know, listen to her's last single, which is going to be really futuristic mm -hmm. and, and out there. And then, you know, Sabrina Claudio and all these, all these kind of things. So that's a huge, um, a huge sound palette to draw from just R&B music. She's going to be down with it. And she has such an interesting voice that it's going to sound uniquely her no matter what I do. So that's great. Um, Another really big, uh, well, I guess they're all equal, but this is my favorite of the Cornerstones, is Jazz Harmony. Meg really likes chords that have, you know, the, the extra notes in them, the ones that, that pull your heartstrings. So I get, to, I get to use, you know, higher extensions and, you know, like jazzier kind of flavorings that uh, I think a lot of pop producers are afraid to sneak in. Like if you're doing a Taylor Swift song, you're probably not going to use the same chords that Meg likes. Yeah, no. And that's a very, um, I'm not saying we're the only people that do it, but it's a very characteristic Which, thing yeah. that, that we enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then another cornerstone, the last one I would say, is live instrumentation. Um, I grew up playing the bass, and then I taught myself guitar and keys, and Meg loves all of it. I try to play as many live instruments as I can on each track. Mm -hmm. uh, the track you're about to hear us record as me sneaking in some uh, some live bass on top of some big ass 808s. So it's always um, it's always 
a unique and fun challenge to figure out how to pair the live instrumentation, which you kind of don't really hear that much anymore, with like the big bombastic production mm -hmm. of today. Um, and that's, so that was Meg's Pyramid as far as the tracks, the music, um, which I produce. And I, I would say Meg's Pyramid, uh, as far as her vocal delivery, which I've never asked her, this is just what I assume. Um, let's see how much she agrees with me. Um, I would say, number one, Meg has like a very sultry, nonchalant, relaxed delivery. Like Meg, you know, she feels chill and effortless and uh, just, she's got a swag about her. Um, I would say number two is her lyrical content is very, um, very vivid, a lot of imagery, but, and sometimes it's not very, sometimes it can be very direct and sometimes you can really obscure, you know, you can kind of like weave around what you're trying to say. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, very metaphoric, uh, you know, just kind of, very interesting lyrics. Like you talk about very personal things. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say, as far as the vocal production, I use a lot of, a lot of big reverbs, a lot of like cold eighties plates, just, um, I don't know, I guess really early on, I figured that that really works with her voice. And also Meg, Meg's voice loves compression. Um, some people don't really handle that well, but Meg's compression. voice just, it just loves it. So, I love it so much. um, yeah, that would be her three cornerstones. Uh, the sultry, nonchalant delivery, the very poetic, personal, introspective lyrics, and then the kind of dreamy, ethereal vocal production. You know me so well. Yeah? I was going to say yeah. how I do, but I know I did well. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, you know me so well. I mean, I would, just to add to that, because you kind of covered most of it, I am, I am first a lyric girl. That's what I honestly look for in any song, if I can pick it out and create a story with it in my own and that's what I kind of incorporate when I'm writing too, making sure that it's authentic to myself and and uh, and telling some sort of story that I've been through mm -hmm. um, but then also creating that those those pockets of of uh, space for other people to kind of interpret what I'm saying on their own you know a song could be written about something completely different and I hear it as personal as it can be and it might not even be about that but it still speaks to me that way so making sure that there's areas there what I'm either what I'm saying or what I'm you know what I'm scatting on or whatever just just in ha just having that freedom for the listener to, mm -hmm. to to start kind of going through their own imagery on, on their own um bass you are an amazing bass player and I love how the bass kind of drives our songs it keeps me moving and it keeps probably the listener moving and and uh it creates a vibe like an immediate vibe whenever we write i always want you to just like throw down some bass lick or whatever and that usually kind of sets the mood of the day um if we don't necessarily know what we want to talk about right when i walk in mm -hmm. so that that i love that and that and that that's in all the songs that we do i always i'm like turn on the bass turn on the bass please we should probably just start with that Why i mean we... Yeah, we usually do we usually do, or it's like a guitar little lick thing. But you're yeah. you're more of a bass player than a guitarist, even though you're 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 dope at guitar as well. But no, 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 you you know you know okay. your bass your bass is your bass is off the chain. Um, and then, like you said, live instruments, keeping that raw organic vibe to incorporate not just R and B listeners, but then also other people that don't necessarily listen to that every day. Mm. But once they hear that, you know, that horn or that electric guitar or. Mm -hmm. You know, just any type, any type of real anything. It kind of your ear picks it up, and it and it's a ground. It's nice grounding to the mm -hmm. song. And I, I, you know, my my music taste is all over the place. I do love making R and B, but I listen to a ton of stuff. Right. And uh, and I'm that listener as well. Like I can listen to something, and be like, oh, but like that bridge is sick because you know those keys come in and it's super just like stripped down and and real. And I, I don't know. It just it it, it speaks. And I feel like a lot of people feel that. Yeah, and, you, and you're also the type of listener where you'll hear a reggae song and you're, you're like, Jamie, yeah, how, exactly. do we, how do we put that into exactly, our thing? Exactly. Doesn't even have to be the same genre. Yeah, so. completely. Yeah, some of all of it's so good. Yeah, that is a good one. <laughs> yeah, you guys will hear that. You'll hear it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a very interesting uh, topic, which uh, I probably mentioned before. And if I didn't, I'm going to mention it now because it's very important. Um, would you agree, Meg, that an artist... What an artist chooses not to do is just as important as what an artist chooses to do stylistically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Um, 
Yeah, because, you know, Meg's music, we don't really have EDM builds and drops and heavy metal guitar. And, like, I personally really like all of those things. But if I put every single thing that I liked or we liked into Meg's sound, it would just be... It'd too be, much. Yeah, it'd be too much. It'd be like if you're... If you're making a stew or a pasta dish and you put every single thing that you like in, it's going to taste like nothing. There isn't enough of any one thing to pick it out mm -hmm. and enjoy it. So that's kind of the um, the impetus behind the, the pyramid idea. If you have three, you pick three things that you really like and you give as much as you possibly can of those three things. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that'll never get boring or overwhelming for the listener. Yeah. Now you want to stay as specific as possible and also sometimes simple. That's when yeah. the beauty comes out as much as like we, and you can find it too. Yeah. And, and take some stuff out, add some stuff, take some stuff out. Yeah. And, and honestly, Meg, like your fans, they, they know you as R and B soulstress, all that kind of stuff. Like they're not really looking for you no. to sing salsa. No. And luckily we were able to find that sound and, and release it and get some good feedback of it because you know, sometimes artists need to release a ton of different types of things to see what people want to hear you on. And yeah. we found a home. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of artists make the mistake, I think, of, you know, oh, the tropical Kygo thing is popular right now. Mm -hmm. Let's do one of those. Or let's do, uh, let's do a trap one. Or let, you know, they, they keep chasing these genres. What you really want to do, at least this is what, what I do, and I'm blessed to connect with artists that feel the same way that I do, is you want to find your sound and and uh, be re be really different, like kind of time stamp it for the future. Uh -huh. Like do something that three years from now people are gonna be like, oh shit! Like how did I miss out on this? This yeah. person's been doing this for this long, and just kind of sit in one place with a sound, and then people will notice. Like don't don't chase trends. Uh -huh. And as you sit there, you know you, you create your own. Yeah, and it'll evolve. You know, unique. Obviously. Yeah, you, unique little aspects of it too. So. Mm -hmm. You know what's interesting? I think it's important. Uh, a lot of people are write, are scared of writing, not bad songs, but they're afraid to write songs that don't work for them. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that that's a very important uh, part of the process because to to be able to feel why a song doesn't work for you, you gotta know is, what it's yeah. Yeah, like that's the that's way different than like someone telling you like, oh, this doesn't work for you. But when when you feel in your own soul like, oh wow, this doesn't work for me, yeah. then you. You know, you uh, you very viscerally know like your path. Uh -huh. So the the bad songs, I don't say bad. I mean, maybe some of them are bad, but uh, <laughs> just you know, the songs, the that unused don't... ones. Yeah, yeah. The unused yeah. ones are just as useful serve, to me. Yeah. Yeah, they serve you just as much. So sweet. Respect. Well, I think you guys are about to hear um, Meg and I do some recording, and uh, you'll hear. Um, the type of conversations and the type of things we talk about when we were recording vocals, which um, may be new to you guys, may not be. Um, that's awesome if it's not. And kind of story too, and emotion when you say it. Yeah, yeah. Well, don't don't story, give it away. They gotta. Story. No. Yeah. No. I mean, stick they gotta around. wait for the next video. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, see you guys in the next video, guys. Bye.